<laughs> Hello, uh, good evening everybody. My name is Chris Sargis and I'm the Chief Executive of the Norfolk Chamber of Commerce. Now I'd like uh, as the following people to join Rebecca if they may. So that's Dr. Claire Hines from the UEA, um, Emma Partridge from Greater Anglia, and Adam Smith from The Economist. Yeah, The Economist. Uh, and Richard Ross from Chadwick. So if you'd like to join, that'd be great. So while they're getting comfortable, just a few words from me. Um, really, our assembled panel represents a very impressive bank of knowledge and experience on the subject of equality and equal opportunity, uh, diversity, so taking into account the differences between people and groups, and of course inclusion, which to me is about it's part about uh, creating environments where people and differences really do thrive and succeed, which I think is quite an interesting uh, topic of conversation tonight. But uh, this is um, such an interesting and complex topic. We've only got about 30 minutes, which will include some, hopefully some good Q&A from you guys. So I'm aware that, ironically, perhaps in light of the fact that we're talking about diversity and inclusivity, we may not get time to be able to cover all and every aspect tonight. Um, also, these topics can provoke strong reactions. So let me just be clear. Uh, the main aim of the panel is to pull together their collective experiences, really, and discuss practical ways that businesses and organisations might take uh, when approaching the challenge of equality, diversity and inclusion, um, and to offer some insight that can be taken away tonight and applied. So hopefully we won't get into uh, intense debate about why the challenge had existed, and if we do, then I'm doing a bit of a rubbish job. So, hugely impressive panel, welcome. Yes? You all look comfortable in your comfortable chair, so I'm going to pull up this slightly inferior rickety chair. <laughs> all right, but that's fine. Um, so, I think we can actually assume uh, that many of our audience here are striving uh, to create uh, culture and diversity and equality and inclusion in their own workplaces. So, who then would like to start by offering some brilliant insight on their best approach to diversity, equality and inclusion, maybe with bonus points as how effectively you blend each three? Who would like to go first? If you don't say, I will name one. <laughs> Rebecca's looking at me, so I feel like I should go oh, first. Oh, actually, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm sorry, I've jumped the gun. Intro. Would you just mind giving me, everyone in the room, a quick intro to who you are? Yeah, sure. So I'm, uh, I, I'm Adam Smith. I'm the slightly better looking version than um, up there <laughs> um, in the bottom right. I'm audience engagement editor at The Economist, which means that I help to run all of our social media channels. So anything that you see posted on Facebook or Twitter, etc., from... The Economist comes through my team. I manage a team of um, nine people, uh, and so and uh, I think a lot about diversity and inclusion in how I run that team within a bigger organisation. And also, I help to run the staff LGBT network for um, the big Economist Group company, which is about thirteen hundred people. Great, thank you. That's the size of the company, and not the number of LGBT people. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Claire Hines, a uh, lecturer in literature and creative writing here at UEA. Um, I, um, I write fiction and non-fiction, and I've got a background in journalism. Um, I write occasionally for The Guardian, I write opinion pieces, mainly around issues of equality. And in my department at UEA, we really actively trying to think about issues of inclusion, and in particular about decolonising the curriculum. Rebecca, it's up to you, but we can skip, because we all know who you are. <laughs> yes, we'll you skip. can skip me. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Emma Partridge from Greater Anglia. I work in the Innovation and Continuing Improvement team. And um, in order to develop innovation and sustain continuing improvement, having an inclusive culture is very important for us. Hi, I'm Richard Ross. I run a small financial services and business, and business advisory team here in Mason, the, the Enterprise Centre. Um, we specialise in helping people build stronger businesses. Uh, we're a very young company. The average age of the company is 32. And they worked out the other day that if only I'd leave, it would go down to 27. <laughs> <laughs> you, think, you think you've got a problem with age, actually. Uh, um, um, I very kindly had the caricature done of me three months ago. And I was comparing it to the new one that's done. And I've aged about 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> More <laughs> lines on that call. Right. So, anyway, back to business. So, the question that I asked before I forgot to introduce you was um, uh, can you offer some brilliant insight on the best approach to diversity, equality, and inclusion, um, and really how you kind of blend the three in, in the business community? Who would like to go first? So, okay, I'm going first, I guess. Um, so, 
answering very um, specifically from the way that um, me and a colleague have run the social media team at The Economist, uh, in terms of recruitment, we have uh, put in place things like um, uh, not looking at CVs on the first uh, sift. Uh, it's not half as relevant as looking at a sample article that we ask people to write for us. Um, that helps us to see what they can do, uh, how they can write, how they can think. Uh, so that is some um, far more valuable insight into who they are and how they work and how they might work for us than looking at their CV, which um, includes you know, all their experience in their schooling or whatever. Um, but I'm just more interested in what you can do. Um, so uh, that helps somewhat. And then in the, um, uh, uh, in the interview process, we make sure that we've set questions in advance, uh, agreed our questions with the every, um, all of the, um, me and my colleagues who are like, doing the interviewing. Uh, and so that we uh, know which questions we're going to ask, so that we make sure that we ask the same questions to everyone. Obviously, there's room for conversation within that, but we know kind of what are the broad topics that we want to cover um, in the questions. We set scoring criteria in advance, and then we all score candidates separately, and we don't confer until uh, we've done all of the candidates, and then we look through them all, and then we challenge each other on the scorings and the decisions that that we're, um, that we're saying. So interesting, if someone is scoring one person quite different to the other people, um, then you know we'll kind of question each other why. And for me, it might be something like, oh, well, he was a northerner as well, so maybe that's why I liked him, or um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and, then, um, and then in terms of like including people when they're actually with us, uh, there are um, various different things that we've put in place as well there. Um, making sure that we're just available as like team managers and that we know that we, we try to be like approachable and people know that they can come talk to us um, and just kind of making sure that people know that that um, that they can say things kind of like monkeys we don't call them monkeys um, <laughs> <You> should. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah they, they can raise monkeys um, if they want um, and um, making sure that they can bring their personal life and their personality uh, to work if they if they want um, I think, and I, I think that um, you, know, you know, obviously, you don't have to do that. But I'm quite open and quite um, like I, br I bring my personal life in, into work a little bit as well. So I hope that that kind of like sets a certain tone. Um, and um, yeah, there's other ones, but I think we should move on <laughs> to include other people. <laughs> just just before we move on, I mean, that, that's that's a very well thought out approach. Was that was that something that's come in fairly recently? Is it something that's evolved? It's well, the social media team at the Economist is. Um, just over three and a half years old, right. uh, and um, so that's when I was hired, and we kind of set up the team then, basically. And um, we had a different boss at the time, who was the person who set the team up. Um, but then, after about six months, um, there was uh, two of us. Other two others um, of us were kind of like managers, and one of those became the main lead of the team, and I was her deputy. And we then set in place. Um, we kind of took over the team a little bit, and we set in place like all of these things by thinking things through and saying, right, you know, we've got the power now. We can do things how we want to do things. And even though other teams in the editorial department, um, they might do things differently, and the editorial department does things differently to like the rest of the company because we're quite separate from the rest of the company because of editorial commercial divide, which is like a traditional thing in newspapers. So um, there are all these kind of divisions, and we were just like, you know we've got control over this domain, so let's think about this. Let's look at research on unconscious bias. Let's think about our own experiences, me as, um, I don't know, like with this accent and, and being gay and, and the, uh, you know, being, going to a former polytechnic university and finding myself in an organization where most people are from Oxbridge, that kind of thing. And then she was a Chinese Canadian um, in Britain, married to a Brit and kind of scratching her head over that. Um, so we kind of brought our own things and we kind of questioned all these things and we just thought, okay, well, how, how would we do it? So we just looked into it and then we just set in place those things on our team. Amazing. How about a perspective from the UEA? Um, well, I can't really speak on behalf of UEA itself, <laughs> but um, uh, UEA has um, signed up to initiatives like um, the Athena Swan, um, which is about... Uh, women and um, ensuring equality and the race equality charter as well which is about you know again thinking about what's going on in equality with uh, bme communities or individuals um, but in terms of um, the de my department um, we're looking at things like um, decolonizing the curriculum as i said and that might seem like it's a sort of you know sort of weird university <laughs> thing that might not apply but I think it does apply to the discussions today because it's about 
Um, it's really about inclusions. It's not about saying, oh, let's not study Shakespeare any, anymore. It's about thinking about um, in, including different perspectives and approaches in, in curriculums. It's about thinking about, you know, who produces knowledge, um, you know, and it not necessarily being about dead white men, and it's, it's not necessarily a race thing as well. It's about, um, you know, knowledge in a broad sense. So I, I think about how my background works with that in terms of not just being a, a brown person, but that I've come from a journalism background and I'm in a new institution. And, you know, let's value different kinds of knowledge. Let's value knowledge which isn't necessarily a sort of traditional academic knowledge. So those, those kinds of things. Um, also thinking about, you know, learning environments. Obviously, uh, university is a very, has a, a lot of sort of ritual around it. You know, it's all about graduation ceremonies with gowns and, and funny hats and all that kind of thing. Um, you know, and we want an environment where everyone feels comfortable, you know, whatever, whatever background, whatever your experience, that everyone feels included. So we're thinking about sorts of things Rebecca talked about in terms of building a community um, and just making, you know, thinking that university isn't just this sort of ser serious place which is about old archaic procedures. It's, it's about people connecting and having fun. So what can we do in terms of, you know, making our environments uh, more pleasant um, and, um, you know, organising informal events for students which aren't necessarily around their studies. Um, so those sorts of things, yeah. really. Excellent. How about you, Rebecca? I mean, as a Norfolk employer, starting from scratch, yeah. trying to get those three elements in, what challenges and thoughts have you got? So one of the areas that we're quite lucky in is being in digital marketing. It's quite a new industry. So uh, achieving things like uh, pay equality is relatively easy because we don't have this history that, like if we were solicitors or, you know, in some of those much more traditional areas. Um, we also, as a company, have... So to start off with, there were two men, two women setting up the company. So we had a gender balance right from the start. And we did have a few years where we pretty much couldn't find great men. <laughs> um, and we, had, we had about three... Yeah, sorry. We, no, we had about three years where we um, kept thinking, gosh, we keep hiring women and we ought to hire more young men. At the time, we couldn't really afford to hire people with a huge amount of experience, so it was often students. And we just experienced the women coming through with so much more clarity about what they wanted to do. Um, and it was, it was only really in that sort of large growth phase that we balanced out a bit. Yeah. Now there are a few more women than men, uh, but I'm incredibly proud of our gender pay gap, which is um, it's about 2.83% in favour of women. And um, it's very, very hard to get zero. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm really proud of that. And the thing that I'm aware of is that right from the start, we monitored those things. So right from the beginning, the second we started hiring people, we started monitoring them. We are also in Norfolk, and uh, at, before our before our moment of redundancies, we hit a point where our diversity internally on the team in terms of race and background was much, much better than the county, but we're never going to get an incredibly diverse team recruiting here in Norfolk, though the university is fantastic for helping us find people with very different backgrounds. Um, I think that something that we could probably all relate to on the panel um, is to do with class and diversity. I think it's really hard um, to make sure that we are looking across the whole spectrum because often when you you know when you're sitting there recruiting for a role yeah. you need someone now <laughs> and you need someone who has good experience who's going to come in and be very ex experienced so it's something that I'm aware that I'd like to look at um, but I think from from my point of view everything that we can do about diversity is about just monitoring it so tracking it having a spreadsheet tallying up what people are being paid what backgrounds they have um, and sort of looking at it across okay. lots of different. So that, that, that's really interesting. I'm thinking about what I, what could we take away from these conversation sessions. So so, how do you track it? What's your spreadsheet look like? It has all of my staff members. Yeah. It has all of their so little symbols for their details. So M for male, F for female. Yeah. Um, different. I, I think I've just got um, BME or white um, for racial. And then it. Um, I use pivot tables. We're jazzy with our Excel spreadsheets at Fountain. Um, Crazy I use modern types here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I do a little pivot table to work out. And the thing that I'm looking for is not just the overall gender pay gap or uh, pay gap across systems, but also yeah. looking for in different areas and different levels of the business. So people of, of very experienced people at Fountain 
is the gender pay gap, does it still stand there, of people who are right at the start of the, their careers, are the, is the gender pay gap um, balanced there as well? So it's, uh, I guess, I'm, from, I'm in digital marketing, everything we do is about gathering data, so I just took the same approach to, um, to looking at our pay gap. The step beyond that, that I think, because that sort of helps with the diversity thing, but when it comes to inclusivity, I think that's where we as employers just have to be really aware of it, right. and I think it's a different question to the diversity issue. So probably a very different set of circumstances for you guys at Valo Anglo. I mean, you, your employment, like, you, I don't know how many people you employ, but it's probably... 3,000. Right. Yeah, so um, wow. we've recently released the gender pay gap, and it was in managerial level, it was about 26%. So um, not great. Um, and with the industry being largely male-dominated, I think there's only 23% of females within GA. So um, rightly or wrongly so, there's um, been a women's group set up called UP, <laughs> and um, they're looking at supporting women applying for jobs that were stereotypically male, so things like become a driver. Um, and they are helping women with their confidence, um, coaching, mentoring. But I believe that um, GA needs to spread that out to all employees because it's, you know, it's not just the difference between male and female, it's about training everyone and giving them equal opportunities in that sense to be able to... Um, fill their career aspirations. So um, one of the things we're also doing with the pay gap is to look at um, job evaluation and base it on skill, experiences and responsibility. So it, and that needs to all be very transparent in moving forward in order to um, decrease the pay gap but also become an inclusive organisation. So have, have you noticed a shift in the last sort of three to four years or five years, there was a particular catalyst that caused it to... I've only been there one year. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? been there one year. But yes, definitely a shift. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you about 12 months I, was, I was the statistic that tipped them over. <laughs> you arrived and... Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Sorry. So, Richard, from your perspective, and also because you interact with an awful lot of organisations, other businesses, is, is yeah, I, I, th I think one of the problems we have is, is you know, as, a, as a wealth manager, I can tell you, you get maximum diversification benefits when you have 30 holdings. We've only got 10 people, so we aren't going to get maximum diversification. <laughs> what we can do, though, is we can establish a culture that's inclusive. And I think the way we try and do that is we try and keep our people curious. We try and we, we take young people on who want to make sure they're still learning, they're still finding out about things, they're open to new ideas. I think that's the core of a culture which is embracing of exclusive, inclusive, exclusive. That's tomorrow. Um, <laughs> it's, it's embracing the inclusivity and it makes it more likely that you are going to, to attract a more diverse work workplace. Um, yeah, we interact with, um, we have lots of different, we're fortunate in being based at the UEA, we, we make lots of use of internships, of um, Reasonable length work placements, sort of, sort of one month work placements over Easter and things. Quite often, there, we, we had someone who we worked with the School of Economics to um, uh, propose dissertation subjects. So people do research projects for us. So the one who worked on one last year was from Kazakhstan. I never knew where Kazakhstan was. <laughs> I Google map to Google Street Map. And so, and exactly where she lived in Kazakhstan. She really, really like, I suppose that's a bit like Wales, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, but just that sort of opens up that idea that you, you, you understand more about different people. Yeah, we do have some diverse, diversity within our... Uh, we've got some with purple hair. Now, that is reasonably diverse, isn't it? But I think the important thing is to try and get a culture that supports and is open to inclusivity. And that's really what we're trying to do. We think that by, by creating a learning organisation, a learning culture, everybody in Chadwick's is encouraged to learn more stuff. We don't mind what that stuff is. We just want to learn more stuff and be really keen to find out more stuff. And that knowledge of stuff, that, all that stuff, what they don't do is then, 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 then share it. So one of our people, the, the, the stuff they learned was around cosmetics advertising. Nothing to do with what we do. But it meant that it gave us a greater insight into millennials. <laughs> And suddenly these people who we thought were the snowflake generation, sorry guys, <laughs> um, suddenly became really important. They're the, they're the movers and shakers of the next generation. So we tilted our proposition so it was more relevant to that generation. And our average age of our client went down by seven years. And we're, we're a business that works on lifetime value. So it's seven years, but so it's a tangible benefit from just adopting a culture that encourages inclusivity. 
encourages this sort of thing. Wow, that's really interesting. Thank you for that. That's really good. Um, so we touched on gender pay gap. So let's let's just push into that a little bit more. I mean, uh, how do you guys approach issues of equality such as gender pay gap? What's what's your or what's what are your thoughts on how, how, how to approach it? The, be the best way to come. Well, I think that I mean it's great that it's named now. I mean, you know, that the legislation that changed that's meant that you have to report it if your company was above a certain size. You'll get there, Rebecca. You'll have to report <laughs> it eventually, <laughs> but you have a good one, and you know it already. Um, yeah, I, like that's the first step, right? Because if you you know you've got to name a problem. Um, a monkey. A monkey. Thank you. <laughs> um, in order to understand it and tackle it. Um, the Economist Group, the company, um, has a gender pay gap of 32.6%. Um, one, of the, the main reason for that is not that men and women are paid different amounts for doing the same job, but um, what's quite common is that um, the senior, more senior, well-paid positions are generally more held by men, um, and that I think is quite common among places with a significant gender pay gap. Um, and so, I mean, that's the company as a whole, and I only have. Um, you know, like responsibility for my particular area, and I tend to hire. We we hire like they're all um, relatively young people. They're they're, rel they're junior positions for the most part. Um, but I think that um, what I've been keen to do is just work with um, making sure the way that we manage people on our team um, to make sure that they know that um, you know as you know the the women on the team that they that kind of um, I push them just to you know. That you push. Sometimes you have to push them a little bit harder, not to do the work, but to 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 put themselves forward to do things, um, because we know that women hold hold themselves back. So I just want to jump in with a funny story, which is about how I met Adam, uh, <laughs> where um, we were at an event where um, people were being asked to talk about different topics and. Several of the women there were invited to talk about feminism, and all of us sat and said, "Oh, I'm probably not the best person to do it." <laughs> we ended up having an event without talking about feminism, and we were talking about many other things. And it was a, it was a really sort of highlighted moment where we all sat there and went, "Well, I do know about this, and I do have a lot to say about it, but oh, someone else is probably better suited yeah. than me." Whereas that wasn't the case with any other with topic the other on topics. the table. Other people were like, "Yeah, sure, I'll talk about." And, and I just—I mean, it's—it's it's well shown now that um, that women do hold themselves back from like applying for jobs. You know, um, there are the, there's plenty of research that shows that um, men apply for a job if um, you know if they if they kind of think that they're qualified, um, whereas like women, you know, tend to only apply for a job if they definitely think they really are qualified, um, and that's one of those problems. So you know, we hire junior people on one-year contracts. At the end of that one year, um, we know that we we can't take them on. Um, so I, um, I'm always sending them job adverts, and I'm just like, go for this job, or I hear so and so is hiring, go for this job, that kind of thing. Um, so I think that, I mean, like in terms of like the younger generation, you just have to make sure that they're pushing themselves for these things. And you know, one of my colleagues, um, she's just got another job uh, soon, and she's going through a salary negotiation with them right now. And um, she, uh, me, and um, more importantly, other people around her are telling her to like um, exactly how to, um, not telling her, but like, you know, helping her and like supporting her and making her confident to go through that because it's, it's you that, know, is, that's is the that generation. Is that a legacy then, do you think? That, that <sighs> um, yeah, it's ingrained sexism and misogyny, I guess. Like right. it is, yeah, I mean, it's just a kind of like we're all swimming in it. It is a legacy thing. I mean, I'm not just saying that about my organisation. I just think that that's yes. just, that's just the thing that's sure. all around us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to kind of um, agree with what you're saying and also disagree because I think that um, it's true, some women don't, don't push themselves. But I think there's a danger in that, in that you know, the focus is on the women and mm. saying, well, they're, they're, they're in the wrong, they're not doing well enough. Mm. And that actually we need to think about the organisations because I know from personal experience, um, you know, that um, there's a perception that, uh, you know, I shouldn't be the one to go for things. I'm like, well, I, you know, I want to go on this scheme and, and try and become a, a research academic, and I've done it, and I got there. Um, and, you know, why shouldn't I do that? So in, in academia, there are teaching, teaching um, academic um, staff, and there are, there are um, research academics, and the research academics are the ones who are who have more support in terms of doing their own research. And I'm like, well, you know, I wouldn't do that. And then people, you know, there's a perception that, well, why, you know, aren't you happy where you are? You're doing well. <laughs> and, and I realised that in my career, 
you know, in the past, that there, there have been these ideas that, well, you, you know, as a woman, you, you should, you're, you're doing okay. And I'm like, no, I want to go for the next thing. So, um, so yeah, that's my response. But uh, um, in terms of the question, um, uh, I mentioned the Athena Swan scheme, and we've been, um, so we're, th this is a sort of university initiative in which universities are asked to think about um, gender and what's going on with pay and what's going on with promotion and that kind of thing. And so it's, it's monitored. So there's a sort of, it's a, it, it, it's a process in which universities sign up for it and they're awarded on the, uh, in terms of how well they do um, a bronze, silver or gold award. So we've signed up for it for the first time. And the process involved a lot of um, discussion and surveys and thinking about, you know, where people are and what people's experiences are, um, and that's been really helpful to, to, to really kind of check in on in terms of what's going on, um, what the problems are, and how we, how we can respond. Thank you. Who would like to go next? I'm sort of happy to talk about Fountain, but um, I'm aware that we're probably going to be running out of time. We're, we're, we're okay for time for the moment. <coughs> Keep it quick. Gender pay gap. And well, like I was saying, and you're one year at Abelia. <laughs> yeah, so it's going to be very quick. <laughs> um, the, um, we have a women's group that I mentioned, and I think the um, the mentoring that they're doing will, um, similar to what Adam was saying, that he's doing is um, will be important. But the um, looking at the roles and basing them on skills, experience, and responsibility, and making that really transparent. I think the transparency is key. And looking, we're looking at our talent management processes, so appraisal systems and things like that. And I think when they're in place, that will support equality, man or woman, and looking to um, progress in a, a career in the rail. And mm. people tend to stay in the rail industry, it seems. So it must be quite good. Mm. <laughs> so. One of the things about um, the gender pay gap and why it's um, sort of persistent, purely from like a mechanistic point of view, is to do with that um, issue of men being in more senior um, positions, and that is because um, men take off less time for childcare and less time to bring up children, especially like when the baby's new and that kind of thing. And maternity leave is generally longer than paternity leave, um, and so um, maternity leave should be long, um, but. Um, I think that more organisations need to have longer paternity leave and, and kind of like make it culturally acceptable within their organisation for men to take time off because then that frees up, um, that likely frees up a senior position that a woman can, um, you know, well, another, any, any person can step in, but that might be um, a woman who can do that. And then she is then become a senior person and shows that she can be a senior person. Um, and also some men might want to also um, feel that they want to spend more time with their babies and their young children anyway. And it's, there's this kind of like weird cultural thing among men about like not wanting to take off too much time, I think. So I think that that's another way of like mechanistically addressing that problem. I think as an employer, that's really hard to shift. We've, mm. We don't have many fountain babies and one of the fountain babies that we have is mine, um, but it is really hard to get the men to take the time off. Right. Um, but what we have done is implement a flexible working policy that applies to absolutely everyone. So it applies to um, our ever our brand manager who's up at the back who goes off and does mountain climbing. Um, and then it also applies to people who have small children and need to get home. Um, and also being really consciously aware that women who are working part-time often end up doing exactly the same role as they did when they were doing full-time because yeah. they get down and they work so hard and recognising that actually, no, we are only paying you for four days a week, so stop staying late. Make sure that your workload is appropriate to your hours, that kind of thing. And I think as employers, that's the kind of thing that we can do to really get ahead of some of those inequalities while society catches up with it being okay for men to take time off. Also, as someone who went through parenthood, we've... Um, we've introduced a teething leave for dads because I had a moment of being like, I didn't need Marcus at home in the first couple of weeks. I need him now when the baby is just screaming all the time and everything's <laughs> awful. So we've sort of started trying to introduce some policies that are parent friendly, um, not just for women, but also for men. Those, Good. It's friendly to the women of those men. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I did note uh, amusingly a few years ago when our local paper produced the first gender pay gap scale in the paper that Norwich City Football Club appeared as the highest uh, offender. <laughs> <laughs> and in mind that all they do is employ men. He thought he was screened it out. 
Anyway, so we've got a few more minutes before we, we need to wrap up this session. And over to you, really, as an audience on a QA. and a Are there any particular questions, any particular thoughts or musings on what we've heard so far that you'd like to put to the, the brilliant panel? Um, we, have we got a microphone? We've got two hands up. Um, go to the nearest lady there, if that's OK. You could shout if you want and see whether we can hear you. Uh, thank you, Arthur, Richard, whether his internships were paid. Yes. The way we work is if it's, if it's, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if it's a week or if it's a week or less as work experience, then it's not paid. Anything more than a week is paid at least at minimum wage. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bush. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello, all. I I've got a comment and a question, if you'll indulge me. Uh, Rebecca, um, I've known you for a while. I think you to be an amazing individual. I'd like to congratulate you on your honesty in relation to the bad parts of the business as well as the good parts. We don't hear that very often, so well done. And also a question, what do you think we can do most easily to make a difference to the things that we're talking about in your experience of the past relevant to what we do in the future that's different? Do you Anyone can answer that, obviously. But Anyone can answer that. Yeah. Do you mean in terms of equality and diversity or in terms yeah, of culture? So, well, I'm almost going to just pass it on back to you because I know that you're working at the moment with um, Engage Norfolk, with Cassandra. with Cassandra there. And I think that um, team engagement is a huge part of this and getting teams to talk about what they need, to be honest with how... I mean, I really hate the term work-life balance because I've just never, ever achieved it and I'm not sure it's possible and it haunts me. But <laughs> actually getting teams to talk about, to bring their personality to work, to talk about what is going on for them outside and, and that only comes through trust that comes through engagement. So I feel like um, the only way that you can solve the issues that team members have is to do what you guys are doing and improve team engagement across Norfolk. Wow. Thank you. That's a quick step. Yeah. Yes. So. Um, one question for the fact one, one word missing. Uh, I'm just struggling with leadership. I haven't heard the word leadership mentioned, and it may be purposeful, so she can get your most. But the context, both in your amazing story, Rebecca, and equality, diversity, and inclusion, has the panel got a view on how much input good or bad leadership has on equality, diversity, and inclusion? Good question. We'd like to hold that. I saw a really interesting comment by Shimamanda Adichie, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and she, she made, made the, the observation that, um, she's talking about men generally, but I think it applies far more to um, overweight, middle-aged white men, <laughs> um, <laughs> is that, the, the <laughs> that we're born and we live our lives with the wind at our back. And, so, and the, the, the fact is that a lot of businesses are run by people who look like me. And we, we find it very difficult, because the wind is always at our back, we find it very difficult to understand those who are actually walking against the wind. And so I think it's a real problem with leadership, is just actually seeing the problem, understanding the problem. And you have to really stand back and try and get, push yourself a different, different perspective, literally and, and metaphorically, to actually feel the wind in your face and feel the sorts of wind that other people feel. If I can just jump in on that. I think that um, the way that I, my understanding of privilege is that it's very easy to see it when it's against you but very difficult to see it when it's not when it's in your favor and i think that as a as a leadership team asking questions and um being curious is probably one of the things that we can do as you were saying about sort of expanding the viewpoints that we look at something from because for example i can talk for a long time about what it's like to be a woman in business i can't talk about what it's like to be a gay man in business or a non-white woman in business there are, and it, there are different perspectives that I think that as a leadership team we need to include and be very open to questioning and um, not allow ourselves to be comfortable with whatever privilege it is that we sit with. I think Rebecca displayed a um, remarkable feat of leadership when uh, in the in the monkeys thing um, and just being open and um, her earlier comment about engagement I would connect to leadership I think that that shows leadership. And I know from having um, uh, like uh, helped to run the LGBT staff network at The Economist that um, we really needed senior leaders to um, like kind of, I mean, it shouldn't be this way, but we really needed them to sort of like recognize the fact that we had this staff network and to um, show up at our drinks events to, to sort of show people that this was a, a significant group that mattered and that people would um, hear from. And I know that uh, 
Um, just recently, we've been talking quite a bit about diversity internally, and um, our editor-in-chief in, in, in our big editorial meeting, which we have every Monday and every Friday to talk about what's going in the paper, um, you know, a, a recent meeting, she said, um, she said, we sp I specifically want ideas on, on this issue at the moment, please email me. Um, and so that was, that was a really good um, kind of demonstration of, of leadership um, because I think that there'd be some people that wouldn't necessarily like just ad hoc, just email her ideas. So she kind of said, this is important and we need to do something about it. And then I took that further on my team and specifically emailed my team and said, she wants ideas, you know, can you send them? And then some of them came back to me um, and said like, oh, I don't know whether I should, I don't know whether I could. And I was like, right, okay, well, let's, let's talk about that. You know, you can take it through me if you want, you can, whatever. Um, but it was funny that like there was, like she was literally asking people to send her ideas and there, there was still this kind of resistance. And then I, as a, as a middle manager, I wouldn't exist in Rebecca's organization, as a sort of middle, <laughs> middle manager kind of stepped in and said like, come on, you know, like, you know, you can do this. So I think that, um, I think leadership's important in that, in engagement, basically. Fantastic. I think we've got time for one more question, if there is. Oh, we've got lots of questions. How brilliant is that? Don't forget that there will be lots of opportunity to, to talk to these guys afterwards. I'm going to go because you're really close and near. I just had a question about the monkey process and whether you see that as something that's singular that works at that time, or is it something that you think would be beneficial going forward to do as your like, business involved? We'll be doing it every six months. So we're going to have moments where we say, right, leave the positivity at the door, let's get the monkeys out. Um, and I think it's not going to be something that we always, like we're going to put it in the calendar and we're doing it that day no matter what, because I'm guessing that our change roadmap will end up getting really complicated and um, a bit overwhelming at times. There are definitely moments where I, like, I feel like that roadmap that we've been working on, that has been my entire job since that. These things, it, everything else that I've been working on has gone out of the window and I'm just sort of addressing these issues on a really regular basis. So there's going to be a moment where we ask for people to do that again and I as a leader also have to at some point shut the door to, uh, my, like my surveys have to get turned off as well because you get to a point where it's like I just can't take anymore. <laughs> <laughs> like, and it's not that there are huge problems, it's just that constant feedback can be a bit much. So our aim is to create very, very clear times that this is when we can put these things on the table. Of course we talk about stuff along the way and we do a lot of workshops and groups, but um, I am really passionate now that we will never get to a point where a crisis would uncover those things, but actually that they would be uncovered just through the natural course of how we're running the business, I hope. Amazing. Right, panel, ladies and gentlemen, sadly we are out of time, um, but please will you show your appreciation for Dr. Claire, Emma, Adam, Richard and of course Rebecca.